Welcome to Navara Live. It's a Friday evening, which means I would usually be joined by Aaron Bastani, but because he's preparing for Labour Party conference and the world transformed, tonight you've got the two mics. Me, Michael Walker, and Mike Bancole. Mike, how are you doing? Thank you for joining us this evening. Thanks for having me. It's, for, it's a pleasure to be here. Feels like I've been, I haven't been on Navara for a while, so happy to be talking to you and to the Navara family. You've got all these ideas saved up to now sort of express to our audience. I'm looking forward to it. Um, coming up tonight, we'll be talking about Labour um, censoring Palestinian solidarity at their party conference. Um, some nonsense from Sunak on his transport plans are really, really embarrassing this one. Um, and um, we're going to end with the person who might just have won the award for the most out of touch person in Britain. Before we begin, a quick reminder, this weekend we have two panels at the World Transformed in Liverpool. Tickets are sold out for them both, unfortunately, um, but we'll be live streaming them here on our YouTube tomorrow and Sunday from 7.30pm. Saturday, um, we'll be with Aaron Bastani about identity politics and class politics. Brilliant panel. Um, on Sunday, Moya's panel will be all about moral panics. They've both got some great guests. Um, they are sure to be you know, incredibly brilliant, insightful conversations. Labour have a spring in their step going into party conference after storming to victory in the Rubber Glen and Hamilton West by-election. The party received 59% of the vote, up 24 percentage points from 2019. Meanwhile, the SNP support fell 17 points to 28%. The Conservative vote collapsed to just under 4%, resulting in the party losing its deposit. Levels of support for Labour in the constituency are similar to 2010, so that's before their support collapsed in Scotland following the 2014 independence referendum. On BBC Breakfast this morning, Scottish Labour leader Anna Sawa celebrated the result. This is not a campaign or result that is a few months in the making. This is years in the making. And both Keir Starmer and I recognise that we will continue to use the same energy, the same humility to reach out and to earn people's trust and support so we can transform the country in the process. This is one stage in a long journey back, but we're determined to do that hard work. When it's described as a seismic win, um, how does that tell you when it was just 37% turnout? Well, I'll tell you why it's seismic. Scottish Labour has not won a parliamentary by-election in Scotland for over 12 years. Two years ago, when I became party leader, we were 32 points behind the SNP. Two years later, we are winning a parliamentary by-election, having gained more than 50% of the vote, double the vote share of the SNP, and a swing of 20%. That is something huge that's happened, not just in Rutherglen Hamilton West, but I think is a feeling now spreading right across Scotland. And I am determined that we use the positivity coming out of this by-election, not to be complacent, but to redouble our efforts, do the hard work, and with humility, reach out to Scots. Because fundamentally, this country needs change, and now only Labour can deliver it. So I've seen some people sort of on Twitter talk about the low turnout. I mean, in a by-election, it is quite normal to have a, a low turnout. It's, it's to be expected that you have a much lower turnout than in a general election. Obviously, in a general election, everyone's thinking about politics. Well, not everyone, but many people are thinking about politics. Fewer in a by-election are. And, you know, this is an impressive win from the Labour Party. It's, it's difficult to say anything else about it. Um, later in the day, Anna Sawa was joined by Keir Starmer, um, who spoke on stage with him and Rubber Glen's new MP. We've changed, and because we've changed, we are now the party of change here in Scotland. We're the party of change in Britain. We're the party of change right across the whole country. And whilst we've been busy here, you'll have seen the Tories have been in Manchester. What a circus. Rishi Sunak pretending that he's going to do things differently. The nodding dog who passed all those decisions that he now says are a complete failure. The Tory MPs tangoing with Nigel Farage. The, the cabinet jostling for the Prime Minister's job because they know that he's not up to it. And we are the party of change. He's still not a particularly inspirational political speaker, but with the Tories in the state they are in and the SNP in the state they are in, Labour do look set to have a pretty good general election next year. Um, on the SNP, Stephen Flynn is their leader in Westminster. He said this to Radio 4. There has, of course, been an MP who disgraced themselves. We've had serious internal difficulties within the party over many months now, which have been long played out uh, in the media, which will hopefully come to a conclusion at some point in the not-too-distant future. We need, But we need to accept the fact that we've taken a bit 
of a kick in. And when you take a bit of a kick in, you have to decide whether you lie down and accept that or whether you get up and you push for the values that you believe in. And I think for us, we need to re-establish um, those. I think we need to put them front and centre uh, of our campaign and re-engage with the, the electorate who've backed us so resoundingly over so many years. But losing a by-election isn't unique. Um, to the SNP. I mean, we lost one in uh, in 2014, in January 2014, by a similar margin to the Labour Party under uh, Alex Salmond. We lost one in 2013 as well under Alex Salmond uh, in the Dunfermline by-election. We, we, of course, won the 2008 Glasgow by-election and then lost the general election oh, yeah. to, late, to late, but we lost to the Labour Party just two years later. I don't think we can, I don't think we should take this out of proportion, or out of context from the, the reality of the situation that we're in. The SNP's turnaround in terms of their fortunes has just been so dramatic. Obviously, Nicola Sturgeon, Sturgeon resigning. She was an extraordinary election winner. Um, she has been replaced by Hamza Youssef, who so far um, doesn't seem like he is an extraordinary election winner. And uh, this is how, I, you know, credit where it's due. Keir Starmer has done a good job in not making the public scared of him, right? So when they see that the the current occupants in power are not doing too well, they're not scared of going to the Labour Party. That's 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 relevant and, and serious and significant. But he has been so lucky, right? Because when he was elected Labour leader in, in the UK, he was up against Boris Johnson. Again, another extraordinary election winner. And Nicola Sturgeon, an extraordinary election winner. By the time he's actually going to face a general election, he's got Hamza Youssef in Scotland, Rishi Sunak in, in Westminster. These are two people with no record of winning elections whatsoever, right? So it does just seem like he's he's had a real good... Um, good series of events. Um, he's, a, he's a man with lots of good luck. I wonder if it will follow him into power if he is um, to win the next general election. Now, on that, on the question of what this means for um, a general election result, this was John Curtis speaking to the BBC. By-elections often give an exaggerated reflection of uh, movements against governments. Um, and to that extent, at least, we can't necessarily assume that Labour would do as well in Scotland in a general election as it's done in Rather Glen in this by-election. One reason, for example, is that it was relatively easy for Conservative voters who wanted to ensure that the SNP lost this by-election to switch to Labour uh, to ensure that the SNP lost, but they might be much more reluctant to do that uh, in a general election. That said, where it has been when oppositions start to produce swings of this size, and this is not the first one for Labour. They had a, a, over a 20% swing in a by-election in Yorkshire back in July from the Conservatives. It's when uh, oppositions start to put in these really big swings that history suggests that they may well be on course to win the next general election. So maybe Labour won't get the 40 seats they had in 2010, maybe they will end up with the 20, but that 20 would in itself may potentially make a significant contribution to Labour's chances getting an overall majority at the next election. Not an easy task for the party because at the moment at least, the geography of its support is not very efficiently distributed and it requires quite a big lead over the Conservatives for them to get an overall majority. That was John Curtis, elections guru. Um, so the seats he was talking about, 20 seats or 40 seats, that's seats um, in Scotland. So seats in Scotland that, that are sent to Westminster. So if, if this swing was seen in the general election, then Labour would win 40 seats in Scotland. Um, obviously, it is the case that people don't tend to vote in general elections like they do in by-elections. So John Curtis is saying sort of uh, 20 MPs is a bit more likely. Um, that would obviously make it easier for Labour to get a majority. Um, Mike, what's your take on the result? I think by-elections are a good way of, you know, getting the mood music around a series of parties, especially for governments. And I think what we've seen here is that, A, you know, voters aren't convinced by the SNP. I think, you know, as you say, I think Labour in a position where everything's fallen in their favour, you know, and when elections is as much about yourselves as it is about your opponents, right? Your opponents are mat matter. That context is really, really important. I think for Starmer and for Labour, the conditions are perfect for them to kind of do well moving forward. I, I don't know how many conclusions we can draw from this election in terms of they're going to dominate Scotland and, you know, sweep up in Scotland. But I do think the signs are, are really, really important. I think there are two things that are important here. Number one is the Conservative vote share fell by 11 points. That's significant. And number two, it, it looks like a lot of unionism voters, voters who are, you know, pro-union, are looking at Labour thinking they're the party that can take on the SNP. So I think that's notable, that's significant. And it looks like Labour positioned themselves quite well um, and that's credit to them, right? They've, they've told the, 
decent story. They they seem to be kind of your know, conditions seem to be working for them at the moment, and that that really is important. So, yeah, this is they're in a good position essentially. That that's that's the story. A bit more detail about the, the historical context, I suppose, here, because if Labour are able to win a significant number of seats in Scotland, that makes their route to a majority easier. Obviously, the more seats they gain in Scotland, the fewer they need to gain in England. But a perceived decline in support for the SNP might also help Labour in another way. Now, remember this election poster from 2015. Now, it shows the then Labour leader, Ed Miliband, in the pocket of Alex Salmond, who had just led the Scottish independence campaign. Now, it was at a moment when the SNP was set to sweep to victory in Scotland's elections to Westminster. And the message from the Tories was this, Labour will only get to power by striking a deal with the SNP, and that will mean the breakup of Britain. So the idea being, uh, Ed Miliband, he's going to be a weak leader, he's going to be um, in hock to the SNP, and he's presumably going to offer them a second referendum or, or, or such like. Um, it was quite effective then, it was very effective in 2015 actually, so for affecting votes in English seats. But yesterday's by-election means a similar attack line in next year's general election will be much harder to sustain. So this is where, you know, the by-election is not just important because it sort of can help us predict what might happen in the future, but because it might also influence what happens in the future. So the idea that Labour are on the up and the SNP are on the down makes it harder for the Tories to attack Labour um, by saying, you know, they'll be in a weak coalition with the SNP. It also, um, I think as you intimated towards there, Mike, it, it means that Scottish voters who don't want independence or don't like the SNP before they might have been voting Tory because they thought, you know, the Tories are the opposition to the SNP, the tactical vote is to vote Tory. Now they'll be thinking, no, the tactical vote is to vote Labour because Labour on the up. So yeah, everything is 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 looking rosy for the Labour Party, both in Scotland and, well, rosier than it was, you know, a couple of days ago, both in Scotland and in England. What do you reckon? Is there a downside? I don't know if there is a downside. I think for, for Labour, going into the conference as well, given how, I mean, the Conservative conference is just an absolute mess. But given how that's gone, given how the by-election has gone, they're in a position of, of, of comfort where they don't have to make big policy pledges. You know, voters kind of are beginning to trust them. So they can just, I guess, for Starmer, he wants to reaffirm his position and, you know, probably do the, the usual attack the left stuff, all of that jazz. I'm sure all those hits will come out and we'll be talking about them on the Navarra next week. But... They're in a position where they don't have to do much. They can just kind of coast to victory. And come election time, look, they're going to have to put more meat on the bones. So I, I was speaking to Gary earlier, and I was saying how when I speak to my friends who aren't into politics, they can give me a fair idea of what Rishi Sunak stands for and what like the government stands for. And look, that's partly because the government get more coverage. But I do think for Starmer, there is the idea of slowly building that story, slowly putting some meat in the bones, and slowly beginning to give voters an impression of what they're going to get in government, because that is important, right? Those stories are important. And the best politicians, you know, Blair, who I don't agree with on, on a lot, you know, these these politicians are fantastic storytellers. So I think that's the challenge that's for Starmer, but he's in no rush to do so because they're in such a position of comfort that he can just kind of coast and just take it easy. We'll have to at some point. I mean, I suppose my worry about Labour is that it's not just that they haven't taken positions. They have taken many positions, you know, involving the debt, involving taxation, which are seriously going to limit them in government. So I actually don't mind when they're sort of ambiguous and they don't make it clear what they're going to do. Um, because, you know, if, if they get into power and they've been ambiguous, fine. But they've got into power and they've actually been quite, you know, clear on certain things, um, which is yeah. that, you know, unless they're lying now, their hands are going to be tied when it comes to public investment and shed loads of things because they say debt has to fall in the medium term and we're not going to increase taxes. So um, while I'm, you know, I'm happy Labour will win the next general election. Well, if they do, I, I, I can't wait to see the end of Conservatives. I think them winning another term would just be depressing for everyone involved. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm concerned that Labour have constrained themselves to such a degree that I'm not sure what they'll be able to do in power, whether or not they have the desire to do it, which again, many of our audience will be um, unconvinced they do. Following a stomping by-election win in Scotland, Labour looks set to form the next government. But Rishi Sunak appears keen to limit what they can do once they enter power. Specifically, he's taking action that would make it harder to reverse his last-minute decision to cancel the Birmingham to Manchester leg of HS2. The Guardian reports that civil servants in the Department for Transport have been instructed to start selling off the land they had bought to enable the construction of Birmingham to of the Birmingham to crew line. So the formal process here is referred to as the removal of safeguarding for land on the route. So that also stops development on land the government hasn't bought. Now, Gareth Dennis is a railway engineer and writer. He told The Guardian this, I knew Sunak would cancel HS2 to Manchester. 
but I didn't expect him to be so spiteful that he would authorise the sell-off of land on the route. There are barely any votes in lifting the safeguarding. It's pure salting the earth to make it extremely hard for Labour to build it. What will happen now is essentially a fire sale. The land is not going to be returned to nature. It's going to be developed on. That will make it much more expensive and much more complex should any future government want to build it. I mean, we talked a lot about HS2 this week. I I think we should have built it. I'm in favour of HS2, HS3, HS4. I think we, you know, we're a developed rich country. We should have high speed rail, right? Um, there's no reason we we can't have that. But this is also an outrage when it comes to democracy, right? Rishi Sunak was never elected by the public. He's the head of a government that ran on a um, manifesto to build HS2, right? The whole of it. In every manifesto since 2010, there's been a pledge to build HS2, the whole of it. Suddenly, He's got into power off the back of, I mean, he wasn't even voted for by Tory party members. No one has voted for this guy. And suddenly he makes this snap decision to say this project, which has been in the works for 14 years, not happening. And it's not that he's put it on pause. You know, he knows that there's an election in a year's time and that it's quite likely he's going to be out of power then. He's not just putting it on pause. He is, you know, burning the house down, essentially saying, I'm going to make it impossible for a democratically elected government to reverse my decision. Well, not impossible, but very, very difficult by selling off the land. You don't need to sell off the land now. Obviously, also, if what you're interested in is sort of making the money back, you don't, never never tell anyone you're doing a fire sale. You know, a fire sale means you're not going to get much money for that land. But it seems that he is more interested in tying the hands of any future democratically elected government than he, he is in sort of any sensible notion of economic management. I think it's really, really disgraceful not just to to make a decision about what happens on your watch, but to tie the hands of a future government when you have zero mandate yourself. And in fact, the only mandate that any government in this country has is to complete HS2, right? So he's going against the manifesto and then making sure that no democratically elected government in the future can change their minds. I think it's completely appalling. Um, Keir Starmer, though, doesn't seem to want to stand in the way of that fire sale. Now, as I say, Sunak, the real bad guy here, but I do think Keir Starmer could be doing more. Take a look at what he said to the BBC on Thursday. What we've seen is a complete fiasco. You've had 13 years of a major project, which has now been completely blown up yesterday by the Prime Minister. And that's billions of pounds wasted and many, many people who were promised something which the government now has ripped apart. Now, given the hole that they've put in this project, I can't stand here and commit to reversing that. Um, Already the government is talking about selling off the land that is necessary to go to Manchester. What I can commit to is an incoming Labour government laser focused on growing our economy in all parts of the country, including the West Midlands, and that will require transport between cities and within cities, an infrastructure that works. And I'm working with local mayors um, and local business leaders and experts to ensure that that is what we can deliver. They've so mishandled the project that they got to this stage now where we've wasted billions of pounds, they've dashed promises that they made, and they are already starting to cancel contracts and release the land that is necessary to go to Manchester. So I can't stand here and say, um, I'll commit to reversing that decision. They have absolutely left a complete mess for an incoming government. Now, his critiques of the Conservative Party and Rishi Sunak, I think we're all completely valid there. My concern is that Keir Starmer likes to pretend that he has no power. He, he, he wants his hands to be tied. You know, it's a bit like a sort of BDSM fetish. This guy wants his hands to be tied behind his back actively. He doesn't want to have to make tough decisions. We saw it when it came to sort of the oil licenses in the North Sea, and we're seeing it again with HS2. Because even though Keir Starmer isn't yet prime minister, he does have a considerable amount of power. Because he is, you know, ahead in the polls, he's expected to be the next prime minister. If he said, when we get into power, we will revoke the licenses for oil exploration in the North Sea, then people wouldn't invest in it. Those projects wouldn't be started because business would say, this is crazy. Why, why the hell would we apply to, to, to start exploring for oil when we know that in a year's time, the project's probably going to be cancelled? Exactly the same could be said about HS2, right? If you are someone who is interested in buying land on the route between Birmingham and Crewe, if you hear the leader of the opposition, who is you know very, very likely to become, become prime minister, say, no, we're going to restart it. Don't buy that land. You're not going to buy that land. So he actually has quite a lot of agency here. Yes, Rishi Sunak is trying to salt the earth, 
But Keir Starmer can do a lot to stop that. Now, I sort of I, I said something along those lines on Twitter today. Someone was saying, well, what about business confidence? He's saying, you know, you can't reverse decisions because that will give uncertainty to business. I mean, what's given uncertainty to business in this case is a 14-year project, HS2 to Manchester, being scrapped on the whim of a prime minister. Seems to have been sort of a decision made over a couple of weeks in a hotel room near his Tory party conference, right? A complete catastrophe. If, if Keir Starmer stood up and say, I am going to deliver businesses the, the confidence and the security they need. And I'm going to do that by saying Labour will win the next general election and we are going to restart this project. That would give businesses confidence to say, okay, we'll, we'll keep planning for this. That would mean that no one would think about buying the land, which is where the tracks are due to be laid or were due to be laid between Birmingham and Crewe. So I, I do think he, he, he likes to pretend he's powerless when he's not. And I can see why he wants to do that. You know, he, he doesn't want to take any risks going into this general election. But it is a worrying, it, it, it's sort of a worrying habit for someone who wants to be prime minister to have. Because obviously, when you become prime minister, especially if you become a prime minister and you're trying to do anything remotely progressive, there are going to be lots of people say, oh, no, you can't do that. You're spook business. Oh, you can't do that. Um, the the treasury say the sums don't, act, the subs don't add up. If, if you want to really change a country, you have to have some conviction to say, I know it's going to be difficult, but I'm going to do it because I believe in this. And I haven't seen any of that from Keir Starmer, like ever, actually, ever at all. Um, Mike, I, you know, the, the real story here is the sort of the democratic outrage from, from, from Rishi Sunak. So I don't want to just focus this on Keir Starmer, but I do have to say I am, you know, I, I am, it's a similar story, isn't it? Rishi Sunak, proactively evil. Keir Starmer, very happy to sort of stand by and let it happen. I call this the Starmer sidestep, where he just kind of sidesteps the question, doesn't offer like his clear stance, and just rambles on about the government being incompetent and the government wasting taxpayers' money, all of the hits, right? And he's right, you know, like the Conservatives have, you know, overpromised and underdelivered. Fantastic, that's all true. But there are times, and we, we spoke about it earlier, you know, Labour can be decisive here. Labour are in control. I think Starmer's doing this whole thing of, look, hey, I'm in opposition. I'm not in, in charge at the moment. I have no power. These guys are idiots. You know, when I'm in power, you know, the Labour Party will focus on economic growth, all these kind of vague terms uses. Fantastic, great. But what does that look like? What does that actually mean in this context? You know, there is time now for Labour to, to put some meat in the bones, like I said, have some conviction, be bold. You know, like you said, brave leaders, good storytellers are bold in these moments. And he does have power. He can really change things if he wanted to. He could stop, in some ways, the Conservative Party from sorting the, sorting the earth, like you said. So I do think, you know, in terms of changing the country, like you say, like you say, Michael, Labour do have to be bold sometimes. And I do worry about, you know, if Labour want to implement, like you say, some progressive ideas, do they have the bravery? Do they have that now? Do they have that fight, the desire? to ruffle feathers, to annoy people, to upset people. I haven't seen any evidence of that so far. And look, I kind of get it. You're leading in the polls. You have to, there's like an anxiety about them, right? Let's not mess up, guys. Let's keep it steady. Let's, you know, not do anything to annoy the, the powerful people, all of that stuff. But at some point, if you want to be progressive, you need to upset these people. And maybe, I mean, it's become clear to me with some of the positions they've taken, they didn't want to be progressive. So, so look, I think we'll see more of this between now and, and the end of the year, at least, and maybe the start of next year, we might see a slightly more forceful Labour. But you're right, Michael. I think Labour can be definitely be more forceful. And it can also be more forceful in terms of hammering the drum about the democratic side of things. You know, Sunak essentially has, you know, completely ripped up a major infrastructure project that has been committed to by a series of Conservative governments. That is a farce in so many ways. And Labour could actually, their criticism focuses a lot on the kind of incompetence and, you know, Conservative Party at it again. But that's a real problem for our democracy. The fact that an unelected man essentially can just come in and just with the, with the swipe of a pen get rid of a major infrastructure pro um, project. That's a problem. So there's so much Labour can be doing. I often feel like this, I'm always saying there's so much Labour can be doing because there is so much they can be doing. So it's frustrating and, and it, it, it says a lot about the lack of boldness and bravery um, of Keir Starmer. Dean Robertson, interesting. Tenor, Super Chat, if you hold your wallet out a little further, I bet someone will inspect it, Michael. Now, I'm not sure if this is something which only people on Twitter will understand or if this is something that is in common parlance. I, I see it mainly on Twitter. So to get your wallet inspected, it means that you're very gullible. So someone comes up to you and says, can I inspect your wallet, please? And then they take your money and you're so gullible that you just hand, you, you just hand them your wallet. Um, I assume this is a reference to me saying that I want Labour to win the next general election. And the, the suggestion is that I'm 
I'm being very gullible to believe that they might make the country better in any way. Um, I take the point. Um, and I do think people are right not really to believe anything Keir Starmer says because he has said a lot of things and then gone back on them. He, he is not a particularly honest man. He doesn't seem to have many um, bugbears about lying. Um, also, many of the commitments they have made, as I've explained, are bad, which is to say we, we will have um, debt falling in the medium term, for example. That's a bit of a disaster if you're not going to increase taxes on the rich. You are, you are massively constraining government. I mean, in that, in that case, we actually want him to actively be lying. Um, I prefer him to be dishonest about that. And then in the end, tax the rich or borrow a bit more money because that's what we need. But why do I think a Labour government will be better than a Conservative government? I mean, partly it has to do with their constituencies, you know, who are the people that they need to turn out to vote. It also has a lot to do with their backbenchers. So when it comes to the Conservatives, even some of the minor reforms that would have probably, you know, improved our lives a little bit. Michael Gove, for example, he wanted to do planning reform to make it a bit easier to build houses. He also wanted to do some some regulations to you know, give renters more rights. Now, that's the kind of thing that if if Labour put forward, it would probably pass. But the Conservatives put it forward, all the backbenchers rebel because they're just, all their constituents are NIMBYs and landlords. Whereas Labour, you have lots of people whose constituents are people who want more housing, who want more rights for renters. So I think it it makes a difference whether the good policies or the bad policies can pass. And, you know, Labour in general, they do always improve the NHS. So th there are basic things within public services that I'm sure will improve um, when Labour are in power, even if they're not going to do any sort of transformative change or necessarily meet the challenges of the moment. They certainly don't sound like they are going to meet the challenges at the moment, but it, there'll still be an improvement on the Tories. What more can I say? Danger of going around in circles here. When Rishi Sunak cancelled the second leg of HS2, he promised the money would be reinvested around the country. And at the same time as he gave his conference speech, his government released this document. Now, the report is called Network North, and it shows the various transport routes around the country Sunak has promised to upgrade with that HS2 money. Now, as you can see, it already looks a bit odd because apparently Network North includes multiple transport projects on the South Coast. And these aren't projects connecting the South Coast to the North, which would make a bit more sense. No, these are just you know bus or rail services within places such as Plymouth. So I don't know why that would be called Network North. But anyway, it gets worse because a considerable number of the upgrades the document promised had already been announced. And some had in fact been completed a decade ago. Now, one example, point 47 in the document, now it suggests that £4 billion earmarked for northern cities could pay to extend Manchester's Metrolink tramline to Manchester Airport. Now, there's a problem with this. The tramlink to Manchester Airport opened in 2014, as the Manchester Evening News points out here. Now, they included a picture of a tram heading to the airport in case anyone in Sunak's team didn't believe them. As well as releasing that document, the government made a slew of announcements on the website of Network North. So this, this new thing they've just launched. And those announcements included this. Reopening stations. Communities in the northeast will be reconnected, including a new station at Ferry Hill, County Durham. The Leamside Line, closed in 1964, will also be reopened. Now that raised the hopes of people who lived between Pelau in Gateshead and Turnsdale in County Durham, where the line used to run. Yet 24 hours later, they confirmed that the Lemside line would not be reopened. In response, the chief executive of the Northern Powerhouse Partnership said this, if this is what they have done and they have gone back on their word, how can we believe anything else that they have said in the last week? How can the Prime Minister have any credibility on the commitments he has made? If they don't honour their commitments made on this, it would be significant evidence of a betrayal of the North of England. So obviously, Sunak stood up there and said, we're going to get rid of HS2, but we're going to give you all of these bus and rail networks that, you, that you've really always wanted in the North. They produced this, this document, or more than one document, saying you're going to have this, you're going to have that, you're going to have that. Within 24 hours, they oh, actually, no, you're not going to have that. You know, at least with HS2, it took them 14 years to do the U-turn. Now it's taking them 24 hours. And that wasn't the only transport U-turn the government has made this week. On the morning of Sunak's speech, Grant Shapps said this. The other thing uh, to remember is we'd still see HS2 trains, regardless of these decisions, roll into Manchester Piccadilly Station and actually to Leeds as well. So the promise there was that while there will be no new high-speed tracks to Leeds and Manchester, both cities would get high-speed trains. So high-speed trains just running on the existing track. But fast forward 24 hours later, um, and Leeds Live reported this. HS2 trains won't come to Leeds as government abandons a £100 million review. So 
again in, in the morning we say don't worry Leeds you know you, you know HS2 is not going to go there or Manchester um, but the trains will come so they'll be running on existing track which to be honest sort of takes away the whole point of the film because HS2 track was about increasing capacity um, so having a new train on the same old track doesn't increase capacity but you know I suppose a, a new train is better than an old train um, but even, even that even that sort of consolation prize was taken away from Leeds 24 hours later. Um, Nick Ferrari on LBC summarised Sunak's mess. The front page map of the prospectus puts Manchester where Preston is. They've got the cities wrong. It says new funding to Greater Manchester could see the Metrolink tram network extended to Manchester Airport. That was opened in 2014. Labour analysis of Sunak's promises found the vast majority, 85%, have already been promised or committed to already during 13 years in power. In a video to promote Network North, Sunak said he would quadruple the number of trains between Sheffield and Leeds. Travel journalist Simon Calder from The Independent pointed out there are already five per hour each way. Five per hour. If he quadruple, <laughs> quadru they'll be queuing up. The trains will be waiting for the passengers. Who put this together? Was this a primary school project? Dear God, there are 10 of them that The Guardian highlight. I'll finish with one. Network North committed to upgrading the A259 from Bognor Regis to that well-known northern city of Southampton. But yesterday, ministers admitted they didn't mean that. They didn't mean Southampton. They meant Littlehampton, which is still <laughs> on the south coast, 45 miles away. OK, so this is an absolute masterstroke. How has this been able to happen, right? So you've got someone who's stood up at his party conference and cancelled, you know, a multi-billion pound project, which has been 14 years in the works, and he's replaced it with sort of a, a set of ideas and plans, which presumably were written on the back of a fag packet in, in the hotel the night before he gave the speech. I mean, it's like he's put it through ChatGPT or something, like write me a kind of transport plan for the north of England. And it has the loosest interpretation of north of England as the first thing. And the ideas that already exist, it's just bizarre. And I think... This is a good kind of like story that epitomizes where the Conservative Party at, where they lack ideas and crucially they lack competence and common sense. I mean, none of this makes sense. Like, how can you scrap a project of the nature of HS2 and put in place something like this? To so put in place a, bit, a project that's going to cost apparently 50, 36 billion pounds, you need to think these things through. You can't just announce these things on a whim. And that's what's happened, you know, and, and, and that's why it makes no sense. And that's why it's laughable. So I think Sunak and the Conservatives are just incompetent. They lack the talent to lead a country. They lack the talent to invest in our infrastructure. They lack the talent to deliver and even kind of put together a, a, a document on a huge infrastructure project that's convincing in any way. I mean, it looks like something that my 11-year-old cousin would put put through chat GPT, deliver and, and present in a school assembly or something. It's just ridiculous. It really is. I mean, she probably, she probably do a better job from Sunak and, and the government, actually. Let me not talk her down. So it's just absolutely ridiculous what, what the government's proposing here. And I, I, I really, really worry for some of the other stupid ideas we're going to hear between now and the general election, because if this is, if this is kind of like a taste of what's to come, then <laughs> we're going to be laughing a lot in Navarra, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, the other thing is when he was saying all this shit, he was standing on a lectern that said long-term decisions for a brighter future. This whole point of like, I'm, I'm here making the long-term brave decisions. Like, it's not a long-term decision to say you're going to build something that was built 10 years ago. It's, it's not a long-term decision to say you're going to build a train line between two cities where you get the names of the cities wrong. So it doesn't actually make any sense. I think in the, in the map, he'd actually put Manchester in the wrong place as well. So the, you can say a number of things about uh, his transport plan, but clearly there was not much long-term thinking done, presumably because it had been written in about 48 hours. So it was all about PR. There was, there was no brave long-term decision there. At Labour Party conference, Keir Starmer's Labour is continuing its tradition of clamping down on Palestinian free speech. How? Well, they've censored the use of the word apartheid. The decision was made in reference to an event put on by the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, which was set to be called Justice for Palestinians and Apartheid. Writing for Labour List, PSC director Ben Jamal explained what happened. We were informed that the party had decided to remove any reference to the word apartheid from the title of PSC's listing for its fringe meeting and event in the conference printed and online brochures. When PSC challenged this decision and sought a rationale, we received an email from a senior figure who informed us that the Labour Party will not publish a description of Israel as an apartheid state. 
When we challenged this decision, the further reply was that the Labour Party would not publish content that, quote, we believe to be detrimental to the party. Now, Israel has been judged to be an apartheid state by Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and the Israeli human rights group Bet Salem. So the use of the term really shouldn't be controversial. Benjamin also said this. A Labour government should be fully committed to the upholding of international law and the principle that respect for human rights should be central to all relations with foreign states, including trade relations. Such a commitment would mean holding Israel to account for its practice of what amounts to a crime against humanity. Now, about the description of Israel as an apartheid state, a Labour spokesperson said this. Keir Starmer has been clear that this is not the position of the Labour Party. Now, what's a bit strange here, right? So this is you know, they haven't actually banned anyone from saying apartheid at conference. They just refused um, to, to put the word apartheid in the title of Palestine Solidarity Campaign's event, right? But what I find a bit disingenuous here is that, you know, it, it's not the case that any fringe event at the Labour Party has to be Labour Party policy, right? You've, you've, you've got talks on all sorts of things at, at Labour Fringe. If it's put in the, the title of an event, that doesn't mean it's Labour Party policy. So this is not just about oh, it's not the position of the Labour Party. Fine, the position of the Labour Party isn't that Israel is apartheid. It should be, right? The position of the Labour Party should probably be um, in line with Human Rights Watch, Amnesty and Bet Salem. It should be, but it's not. Fine. It doesn't make sense to me to say, well, it's not the position of the Labour Party, so we had to take it out of the title of their fringe event. No, this, this is more than that. This is them saying it's, it's offensive, it's detrimental. It's, it, it's a real problem for you to say Israel is apartheid. Not just, okay, that's not our position. It's fine for you to have that position. No, it's saying this is beyond the pale. It's beyond the pale to use words to describe Israel, which are used by Amnesty, which are used by Bet Salem, which are used by Human Rights Watch, right? And which are true, right? If they say, oh, it was always, oh, this row was always about genuine anti-Semitism. If you're, if you're censoring people from saying Israel was apartheid, clearly there was also something else going on. Um, in other somewhat related Labour news, it's been revealed that a party lawsuit against former staffers has now cost £1.4 million. The lawsuit concerns the circumstances of the 2020 Labour leaks document. The party accuses five staffers as being implicated in the leak. All five deny any involvement. And the dispute could drag on for a very long time. That's because the party has requested the trial be postponed until 2025 to avoid it clashing with a general election campaign. Anya Proops KC, acting for the party, said this in a written argument. It would be unfair and inappropriate to contrive matters in this litigation so that, in effect, Labour was having to contend with preparing for running a trial at the same time as it was running a general election campaign. A lawyer representing the former staff members has said this about the suggestion. The former staff members have a justifiable and well-grounded concern that Labour's wish to postpone the claim until after the election is in fact heavily influenced by a desire to avoid, during an election period, litigation which will bring the Labour Party into the public eye in ways it might find embarrassing or uncomfortable, but which it has chosen to bring. Right, so that's the important thing. It seems that Labour are trying to avoid this trial coinciding with the general election because they don't want the public to sort of talk about what they're doing, but they are doing it, right? It, it, it's totally within the Labour Party's power to drop this um, claim, this litigation, which is costing everyone shed loads of money. But no, they want to go forward with it, but they also don't want to be held accountable by the public for it, which to me seems a little bit disingenuous. Three independent investigations have already been completed into the leaks. One was by the Information Commissioner's Office and two were commissioned by the Labour Party itself, neither were able to establish the source of the leak. Yet Labour civil action goes on, it continues, it drags on. Georgie Robertson is one of the five former staffers involved. She said this, or being, you know, who are being accused of having leaked the document. Um, Georgie Robertson said this, having the false allegations that the party makes in this claim hanging over me is taking a significant toll. My priority now is to see these proceedings through to their conclusion so that my reputation can be restored, and I can move on with my life. Now, to me, this seems very vindictive, right? You've got former staffers. They're not incredibly wealthy people. You're not like going up against like huge corporations. You're going up against former staffers. Um, and, you know, it, it's very stressful being taken to court for something like this because it could end up that you have to pay everyone's costs. Labour are racking up 1.4 million. Apparently, there's going to be another 800,000 um, of cost to the Labour Party before this ends. And this is all for something which free investigations have, have found no conclusive result for. Now, I should also say, 
I have absolutely no idea how the Labour leaks document came to, you know, public attention. But whoever leaked it, I'm bloody glad you did, right? Because there was there was a lot in that document which was of massive public interest. I think, as we said at the time, you know, if the, ideally, if this had all been done in a more, um, you know, organised, long term way, some of the names would have been crossed out. But that's not how these things work, right? Because you're in a rush. Da, 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 da. As I say, I have no idea how the process worked. Um, not my role in this organization or any organization but this to me seems like a very vindictive case especially as whenever there has been a, a case between the labor party and right wingers the labor party has just dropped it even when you know their lawyers have said you could win this one they've said oh no we don't we'll, we'll leave the right wingers be you know we won't we'll apologize to them actually um but when it's the left wingers um they they drag on a campaign for five years while you know dangling a damocles sword over their head saying you might be in line to to pay millions of pounds. I think vindictive is the right word, Michael. I think this says a lot about how Starmer views the left. I think there is a real aggression in the way in which he's trying to pursue someone the left. And I think, you know, whenever Starmer's been bold and been a bit, you know, like really dug his heels in, it's usually been not to 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 the Conservatives, it's usually been about the left of the Labour Party, you know, the left in general, the left more broadly. So I think this is a lot about, you know, how Starmer views the left and the fact that he's willing to pursue this kind of vindictive, you know, court case. It's going to cost millions of pounds. And, you know, the people whose reputations are on the line here, I feel really sorry for those people. You know, again, I don't know how the document came to life, but, you know, these people, like you said, they're they're not these high-profile figures in the Labour Party. You know, so it does feel like, a battle not worth fighting for, for Labour, but look, if you're Keir Starmer, it's a battle he wants to fight because I think Keir Starmer has a genuine, visceral dislike of the left. Well, it seems like lots of people around him have a genuine dislike of the left and he's very happy to go along with it. So either he has a hatred of the left or he's very spineless. I mean, we kind of know he's somewhat spineless. Um, but yeah, and what's what's going on there? In any case, it seems vindictive. And as I say, it's very, very different how they treat people on the left of the party and how they treat on the right of the party, both sort of in public, both within the party and even in the courtroom, right? It doesn't seem like due process and the sort of concern for the rule of law is what's motivating Keir Starmer here, the forensic former director of public prosecutions. As you might be aware, we are currently running a um, fundraising campaign. We're trying to get Navara Media fit in, 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 in fighting form before we go into an election in 2024. Obviously, we're not running in the election, but we want to be able to cover it um, very effectively. We know that there are lots of issues that you guys care about um, that mainstream media outlets are not going to be focusing on. We want to make sure we are there to make sure those issues are a big deal when the election comes around. And to do that, we've judged we need 5,000 extra supporters. Um, if you would like to be one of them, um, please do consider going to navaramedia.com forward slash support. We ask for the equivalent of one hour's wage a month or whatever you can afford. Um, everything is absolutely appreciated. If you are already a regular supporter, thank you so much. Um, you are what makes all of this possible. Is this the most out of touch man in Britain? Sir Nicholas Coleridge has been appointed as the new provost of Eton, which is the top role at the posh public school. Coleridge, now a successful author, is an alumni of Eton, so he went there when he was younger, and his views about the school have raised some eyebrows. So they've they've resurfaced after he's got this new job as as provost, um, and the Telegraph has republished this extract from his 1988 book. It's called Eton Voices. It sounds like a great read. Um, in it, he wrote this: Eton made a much more profound impact on me than Cambridge, which I would say really made none. And all my attitudes and real friends were made at Eton. The friendships I made at Eton provide the entire infrastructure for my life now. It is probably true to say that of the 10 close male friends I have, certainly eight are Etonians, and I have not the slightest doubt that it will remain so until I die. I am bound to say that if I meet somebody that I have never met before, for example, if I am traveling abroad or through work or something, and it emerges that they were at Eton, I feel an interest in them that is multiplied by at least 10. There are certain people who weren't there, and I do admit that in some strange and awful way I think, now why weren't they? and that it counts against them slightly. If we are being completely candid, I do accept that I prefer the company of Etonians to the company of people from any other school in the world. Now, there's a lot to say about this. I think my favorite bit is if someone hasn't been to Eton, he says, now why weren't they? Now why weren't they? Maybe it's because their parents weren't incredibly rich, right? Kids don't decide to go to Eton. 
it's 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 a it's a privilege that is bequeathed upon you from your incredibly wealthy privileged parents. So I just sort of say, why weren't you at Eton? You seem you seem an okay chap. Why didn't you decide to go to Eton? Is that maybe some okay chaps aren't actually from the sort of Britain's inbred ruling class. Mike, are you surprised by these these comments from Nicholas Coleridge? <laughs> I mean, that was a fantastic impression, by the way. I'm sure that's exactly how he sounds. Yeah, yeah I've never heard him speak, <laughs> but you can guess, can't you? Yeah, I mean, he's just out of touch. And I think Etonians and that this kind of ruling class living in their own world. And, you know, of course they do, right? Eton's produced 20 prime ministers out of the 59 we've had, I think. That's a lot of prime ministers. These people believe in their hype, and, they, and, and maybe rightly so, because, you know, these people are often in positions of power. So I think he's completely out of touch. And look at someone who, as people who've listened to Navarra know, someone who's attending private school myself, I know exactly what private school lads and chaps can be like. And, you know, he sounds very much like quite a few people I've encountered in my life. You know, he's kind of like, they live in these bubbles and these silos and they don't really know how the world beyond their, those bubbles really work and operate. So the jolly good chaps who haven't attended Eton confuse him because, you know, if you're a jolly good chap, of course you've attended Eton. You know, I only know jolly good chaps who've attended Eton. That's the kind of bubble this guy lives in. So it says lots about how out of touch these people are and just how divorced from our reality and from reality in general these people are he needs to go on the telly more because at the moment you know labor have this policy where i can't remember they keep changing it they're, 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 anyway they're, they're going to make private school a bit more expensive there was a charitable status policy then there was a vat policy they keep fl flicking between the two i think at the moment you'll have to pay vat on your fees but some of the other tax privileges that private schools get maybe will remain um but yeah, we've seen sort of reactions from people on Twitter saying, this is going to punish hardworking parents who, who have to work really hard to send their kid to private school. Um, or, or why are they doing this? This is a big electoral mistake, even though only 7% of people go to private school. Most of those people don't vote Labour anyway. The intention is to sort of say, well, private school, really normal. These are just hardworking chaps. We need this guy, Sir Coleridge. We need him on the telly. We need him on the telly as much as possible between now and 2024 to, to show Britain the reality of um, Britain's private education system, which is all about connections. It's all about privilege. It's all about looking down on people who didn't go to private school. They are not aspirational. They are the opposite, right? They are about saying, you know, his comments, everyone says, oh, it's about aspiration. If, if you were saying, it, however interesting you are, if your parents weren't privileged enough to send you to the most privileged school in the country, I think a little bit less of you, right? And again, this is not some sort of crank. This is someone who has been made <laughs> that the provost, which I had to look up what that word meant earlier today, by the way, is the chair of the board. The so chair of the board of governors is the provost, um, which apparently is a more significant role at Eton than it is in some other schools. Top job, essentially. They have given him the top job, which means that Eton seemed to be perfectly happy with that being the sort of vision of education at their school, which is sort of projected to the rest of the world. We are pretentious, stuck-up assholes. We know it. We're proud of it. We don't care. Like the, the mill wall of incredibly posh people. Let's wrap up there, Mike. It's been a pleasure as always having you on the show. Always a pleasure, Michael. The double M combination always hits. Always hits. Eminem. Thank you, everyone, for watching this evening. This show will be back on Monday, but do tune into this channel this weekend as we have those two panels at TWT at 7 30 on Saturday and Sunday. We also have an interview with Yanis Varoufakis going out. So it's a very, very busy weekend on the Navarra Media channel. So do keep your eyes peeled. Um, if you're going to Liverpool, to the World Transformed, have a great time. I'm holding the fort in London. Um, for now, you've been watching Navarra Media. Good night.